Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, Episode 6. I am your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you. My voice, I think, is back for the most part. And this week, as promised, unlike the week when we talked about DNA sequencing, we do go to South Africa. And so I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ernest. The internet connection wasn't the best. So there is a few spots where the sound isn't 100%, but it's not a bad audio quality overall. A couple of things. One, we have a giveaway coming up in January. All you have to do to qualify for the giveaway is review and rate the show in iTunes. Review and rate the show in iTunes. If you just rate it, I can't see who does that. If you review it, I can see your name there. If you've already reviewed it, then you're in the drawing. And so we will have that coming up. Just a handful of episodes as we're coming down the home stretch on 2016. Two other quick news and notes. I will be in Northern California, Sacramento, Napa area in mid-January. If you're in that area and would love to meet up and discuss energy-related stuff, I would love to meet with you. GlobalEnergyLeaders at gmail.com. That's GlobalEnergyLeaders at gmail.com. We'll see if we can get our schedules together and meet up. Also, I have an article coming out in the January-February edition of the International Right-of-Way Association magazine on surviving industry downturns. So if you are struggling between jobs, trying to find your next job, check that out. I hope it's helpful. And send me your comments at GlobalEnergyLeaders at gmail.com. We'd love to hear that. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Ernest. Besides being an overall just good guy and and someone that's a pleasure to hang out and speak with, he's presently the accredited and educational chairperson of the South African Rights of Way Association, SARWA, the past president of SARWA, Chapter 83, and a founding member of the association, which was formed in 1998, employed as a rights of way specialist in ESCOM, which is the electricity utility company of South Africa, dealing with land and right of way acquisition, relocation assistance, permitting and licensing, appraisal, cost estimates, project management, and title searches. He's also professionally registered as a surveyor with the South African Council for Professional and Technical Surveyors and holds a national diploma in engineering survey. He's a great guy. If you're in South Africa and you hadn't met Ernest, I know we have some South African listeners, you need to hook up with this guy and just just spend some time with him. He's a really great guy, very knowledgeable of South Africa and uh, and really a lot of the other sub-Saharan nations. So without further ado, Here's my conversation with Ernest. Ernest, I've known you for almost three years now, and it's been a pleasure to know you and to get to hang out with you in South Africa and here in the States. So good to have you on the show today, and thank you for giving us just a few minutes of your time. It's a big pleasure, and it's great to share information with all my colleagues and co-workers all over the world. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned International Platform, because that's where we met at, at the IRWA in uh, Charleston, West Virginia, I believe, was the first time we ever met and have had a good time hanging out ever since. Uh, That's right, 2013. Okay, so let's get into it. I know you guys have a Power South Africa initiative, and what is the general state of energy and some of the difficulties you're facing in South Africa as we speak today? Correct. What what has happened is that uh, a lot of rural areas in the country uh, don't have the advantage of having electricity or water or sanitation for sewer and so on. So a lot of rural areas are still on the old systems where you use candles and bucket system and you have to go and look for water at the nearest borehole to try and get your, get your services like that. So there's a big drive in South Africa to get everybody the basic services. And... Um, from the electricity side, our company, our Eskom, which is a state-owned company, has now uh, got like a target to try and get as many houses electrified as possible and try to get everybody on by the date like you said. You mentioned Eskom there. They're a huge company in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. They have many deals going on as well. Could you kind of break down who is Eskom, where are they working at, and what all do they have going on for the audience? Uh, what has happened is that uh, Eskom uh, has, over the years, they have worked out uh, what what does the country itself need so that it can be financially sustainable. And they have then built power stations as they predicted the growth of the economy to grow. And at times in the, in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, we had a lot of excess electricity as well. And then we started forming a Southern Africa power pool, 
where we would then go out and uh, talk to our neighbors and in, in like a forum so that we can understand what their needs are as well. And a lot of our country, countries do not have the same resources as what we have in our country. So we started sharing the electricity with them, uh, obviously selling it to them uh, and building up an, a transmission grid to transmit this electricity through to them across the border so that they can get assistance for electricity as well. So that's been going to our neighboring countries, which is Botswana, Namibia, Swaziland, Lesotho, uh, through to Zimbabwe and to Mozambique. Actually, when I saw you in this past July, I'd just come from Zambia, and I believe when I was there, they mentioned that Eskom is tied up with some of their power deals also. Could you tell us about that? What, what the Southern Africa Power Pool uh, wants to do is to have an interconnecting grid through all these, all these sub-Saharan African countries. And uh, Zambia also falls under the same Southern African Power Pool. And uh, so they are also included in it with uh, a link again from, from the Zimbabwe side into Zambia as well. But uh, all, all the electricity then goes into this network, which is now uh, starting to develop throughout the sub-Saharan Africa. A minute ago, you mentioned that there's uh, a percentage of the population that does not have kind of these basic necessities that, you know, where you're at in South Africa and where we're at in the United States, we have access to drinking water and power. What percentage of South Africa in these rural areas are we talking about that don't have access to kind of what we assume to be the basic necessities of life? Um, the percentage, of, I haven't got the exact percentage. Uh I can check it out for you as well and give it to you just now. But uh, I would say it's getting very close now in, in the rural areas. Maybe uh, you can say around about still about 40% of rural areas do not have it. Okay, so about 40% of the rural areas is, is what we're looking at. And now, now you work for Eskom, and so Eskom is kind of heading up this charge to power these rural areas from the electrical standpoint. So if you could break down in more detail, what is your role working for Eskom in this process? Uh, what what has happened is, is that we have now, uh, our president, Jacob Zuma, he decided uh, in 2012 to set up a presidential infrastructure coordination commission. Under this commission, he has formed uh, 18 different uh, strategic infrastructure projects. Now, we, we, how this will work then is that the, these strategic projects are looking at getting electricity to all, getting the transmission network up so that it covers the country so that they, there's bulk electricity all over, and then the distribution network is to be uh, beefed up as well so that to electrify all the places you need to get the distribution into to take the electricity from transmission substations to through to the distribution areas. Now, what way I fit into the story and my colleagues is we have to go out and acquire land for the substations for transmission and for distribution. We have to acquire servitudes for power lines for the distribution and the transmission lines so that we can integrate all the areas so that we can bring electricity into the areas where they want to electrify and give people electricity. Ernest, so when we think about South Africa, there's a lot of issues that go on with buying a easement, a right of way. Kind of break down for the audience some of the difficulties that you have and the process that it takes to get an easement acquired. Well, the first thing which is very similar to in the States is your environmental impact assessment, where we have to get an, an independent environmental assessment practitioner to conduct an environmental impact assessment for our Department of Environmental Affairs at national government so that they can make a decision where the right must go through. Now, our input into that environmental uh, impact assessment is the technical and the financial side and where we do have some hiccups sometimes is that the the environmental people uh, like the people that uh, 
you with frogs would have, would say, please take your power line and take it around the frogs, which is uh, financially not right because you can mitigate frogs and go through frogs. Now, on the environmental side, there are some challenges, but we're managing to get that done quite well. So on the environmental side, over the years, we've built up a relationship with uh, environmental people, with government departments. Uh, approvals used to take a long time. We've now dealt with the government, used forums with them so that we can get a certain time limits set for, for reviewing documents, for getting approvals for documents. And then the next step is to get the, the negotiations with landowners done. On that one, uh, we have a, a, another problem arising in South Africa at this time that our farmers out there that produce food for us, they have about 13 different new laws, which is actually, in my opinion, preventing them from producing food for us. Now, with all those different laws that they now have to, to work uh, according to, to carry on farming, when we come there as a government-owned company to put a big power line through their property, they are very uh, anti. Uh, becoming a straightaway when you're walking by the door, they are the typical NIMBY. No, not in my backyard. Because we have enough problems with all the government laws. Now you still want to come and mess up my property with another power line through government-owned company. Now these typical laws you get are laws that, uh, that are saying that company, companies must be black owned and a lot of our farmers are still white, totally white, so they've been pressurized to become black owned. They're also pressurized with labor laws that are setting up certain uh, conditions which is making farming uh, not financially sustainable, and a lot of farmers are now trying to mechanize to to, demean, to get the labor side uh, 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 taken away. And if you do that, then it's also another another consequence because now you people are losing jobs, and then the labor problem comes up again. And then with the other laws, like also uh, the new farming laws or farming act, which is coming through now shortly will also prohibit certain subdivisions from land if you want to subdivide land as well. And then there are also laws like if your laborer stays on the property uh, to, to do work on the farm, then you get certain rights, property rights on the property as well. So there's a lot of laws now that are making farmers very anti-government. So on that side, we have to work around that and negotiate with landowners and understand where the problem comes from in that area. Uh, a law that also came through, which is now active from two, last year, 2015, is our SPLUMA law. That is a spatial, uh, it's a spatial Planning Land Use Management Act. This act gives the municipalities in South Africa, of which there's about 286 of them, all of them have to have a spatial development plan for the municipal area. That spatial development plan has to talk to the provincial spatial development plan, which is uh, our provinces are like your states. And then there's a national spatial development plan. Now, all three plans have to talk to each other. Now, if you go and develop anything in that municipal area, you are actually affecting that spatial development plan, which is now has to be re-looked at. So that means if we're going to take a power line along a route through about six or seven different municipalities, you now have to go and talk to the municipality and say, please open your plan. Let me see if I put my power line here, if it's going to affect any of your any of your uh, the plans that you have for the future of that land. But now the poor municipalities are not all up and running yet with the spatial development plan, but they still have to look at our route and they are not resourced to look at it. So that's another complicated issue, which is now uh, going to start delaying projects. However, we have now got the opportunity with government 
to talk with them, to try and work out with the municipalities, how do we make this easier for them and for us so that we can get our route to all these different municipal areas. And we're also very fortunate to have one of the people from government coming to our educational conference in, in March next year, uh, same place as where you're going to give a presentation. Uh, they will also be presenting on the same issue as well. And then the rest of the of the steps to get our our routes registered at the deeds office that works very well. Our deeds offices register our routes permanently for Eskom, no matter who the owner of the land is. So we have permanent rights on the property, no matter what the owners change, which is a very good system and that works very well. Uh, so in that area, it's it's not a problem. And again, we're visiting with Ernest Grinewald from South Africa. We'll get back to him in just a second, but first, let's hear from our sponsor. For over 20 years, R Squared Global has served the energy and infrastructure industries. With offices in Texas, Alabama, and Louisiana, R Squared Global offers engineering, survey, right of way, and GIS solutions. For more information, please visit www.gor2.com. One thing you mentioned there that was pretty interesting is that you have Eskom, which is owned in some part by the government, and the environmental agencies, which are ran by the government as well, in conflict with each other. How does that work in a country where you have the government fighting the government and the government's trying to get this initiative passed? And so kind of walk th- walk through that for us. That is where the big complication comes in, that each government department is more or less got its own uh, a set of rules, set of policies, on how they want to do certain things. Now, if another government department comes in and needs to be in conflict with it, if you want to call it conflict, or or come in to uh, maybe complicate their planning or how they do things, it does cause uh, problems in our country with the different government departments. And for that reason, the the, uh, Presidential Infrastructure uh, Commission, which was set up, was set up to release pressure in that area where government departments should rather work together to make things work rather than uh, saying, no, please don't come this way, we are not resourced, and uh, please don't come into our area, we we haven't got the resources to help you out, and then delay projects in that way. So we are very, very, uh, can you say optimistic that we're going to get a, a big assistance through the PICC than rather than trying to get government departments to do the work that they should do in our opinion that they're not doing. The other thing that you mentioned I want to circle back around to is the white farmers that are having a problem allowing you guys to acquire easements because there's a government program that's encouraging companies to buy from black farmers and that has shifted the market to where the white farmers are now struggling. And so kind of walk us through what's going on with that and what those programs are all about. Uh, what, it, what, what that all boils down to is that um, South Africa decided after 1994 that black people in the country must get opportunities now to get into business, get into jobs, get into uh, land ownership, because they were refused those opportunities in the years before 1994. So there are now acts that uh, force everybody doing any business in South Africa to uh, uh, try and get black people to get into business, black people to produce goods, buy goods from black people and not from whites. So that only blacks are then given the opportunity to grow into the into the different areas in South Africa. So the, the, the BEE, like they call it, is Black Economic Empowerment, trying to empower the blacks. Now this has been happening since 1994, and it's it has it has grown very much at this time. We have uh, one farmer, for example, now that I'm busy with, also a white farmer. He's now, just to show you how, how the thing is now being upset because it's a racial thing, that the white farmer cannot find somebody to sell his goods to because nobody wants to buy goods from white farmers. 
So they would rather buy, he, he must now go and look for people that would like to buy food from a white farmer. So your big organizations won't buy from white farmers anymore. You have to be a black and cowed company to get to sell goods. So now when we went there now from our electricity company to go and buy ground from him and to send a surveyor, he said, sorry, the government has got a law that says blacks only. So on my farm, I've got a law that says whites only. So now I've got a problem. I have to now appoint white land surveyors and white valuers to go to his farm. Otherwise, he doesn't allow us to get any rights on his farm. So you can understand there's a, there's a pressure building up in the country because of this. We, we, on the one side, the economic empowerment must happen, but it's to the detriment of another race in the country. So we have to deal with that when we go out there now and acquire land and rights for, for our servitudes and for our land for power lines. When I was down there about two years ago for the first time, we talked about some of these racial problems that are going on in South Africa, and it seems that it's really not the day-to-day hey, there's, there's a racial tension between a white person and a black person. It seems that these government programs are actually driving this racial divide between the people. Can you kind of talk about that? Correct. Your, where, where your racial tension is, is very light and you, and you can hardly find it anyway, is in the big corporations and in the big areas of business where racial integration has worked very well and everybody... Does, the, does their job without any racial undertones or any racial mention. It, you, and race is even not even considered in big organizations, in, in like in ESCOM, also in government, also in big business. However, when you go to the smaller person who's trying to still economically sustain himself, that is where the pressure is. I want to add a little note here. Ernest audio cut out, but what he essentially said was, The people in South Africa, day to day, they don't have a problem. It's the government programs that are um, causing this tension. And so you look at stuff like trying to get universities or do commerce. That's what causes the racial tension. So it's not a um, white versus black as far as in the social groups. It's the economic impact from the government program. So sorry to steal Ernest's answer there, but I want to clarify what he said. He said a lot of good stuff, but unfortunately, the audio dropped out on us right there. So let's circle back around to the right-of-way acquisition process. It's a lengthy process in South Africa. It takes two, three years to kind of go through this process of permitting and applications and acquisition. Is that correct? Correct. So your environmental impact assessment program, that whole process, that one is about one and a half years. The acquisition for the servitudes on the land and rights side, the right-of-ways, that is two years. So you're looking at three and a half years. Uh, another another point we, we also had a long delay was for our water use license. Our Department of Water Affairs and Sanitation now has to give, according to an act, a uh, water use license for you to cross any water body, be it a water body that only has water maybe once a year. All water bodies have to have licenses now as well to be crossed with a power line or a road or, or whatever pipeline. But on that one, with our negotiations with the government departments, we have managed to get a general authorization where we can get that approval now within three weeks instead of 18 months as well. So that has helped a lot. But the the present one with 18 months and two years is still standing, so three and a half years before construction can start. Okay, so the last thing I want to get into is, and this is why I'm coming in March to do a presentation at your conference is I want to discuss this issue to the audience that you have in South Africa with these nomadic people and their migration patterns and just all of the encroachment issues that come up with this. Because when I was there for the uh, two years ago, one of the things that really caught me off guard was some questions about encroachments and not really understanding the full grasp of what goes on in South Africa. Kind of explain that for our audience and what is going on there and how are y'all trying to work through that? At this time, uh, remedy is is going to be a bit difficult at the at the moment, because with the politics in the country at the moment, our ruling party that has done very well at this to this date to sustain the country uh, as far as growth and industrial growth and financial growth and electrification for doing a very good job at this time, uh, starting from 1994 until now. They are getting a lot of pressure from other from other government, uh, you can say, 
parties that are now in opposition. One of them is a radical group called the Economic Freedom Fighters. Now, their leader, uh, every time he stands on a stage to talk to them all, he says to them, please, people, go and take land. You see any open land, build your house. Please go out there and do it. Now, unfortunately, in our country, there's quite a lot of people that are still illiterate and uh, not having jobs, so they have nothing to lose at all. And with their leader giving them the go-ahead, they are occupying open land. Now, a lot of the open land is our, our easements, our servitudes uh, around the country. And we're having that problem. And also in other open areas where we're still planning to build power lines, which used to be open, are now occupied. It's all illegal occupation. Now, on the one side, government is trying their best to also give everybody a, a place to stay because that's part of our constitution that everybody should have a right to have proper housing. So that is also one of the big drives in government, which is very successful, but obviously not quick enough because it's a big financial burden to try and get everybody to get a house. Now, because they're so far behind, the people that don't have houses would occupy illegally occupy any land. Now, from our side, when we have to go and acquire servitude, if, if it's a new servitude and there are people illegally occupying ground, we then go to the local municipality that is in charge who has jurisdiction over that land. We then speak to them and our National Department of Housing to bring up the 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 waiting list for that area because every area every part of the country has got a planned program for housing but a lot of them have got like on the waiting list which is only going to happen in 10 years time so what we then do is we negotiate and we, with the departments and the local authority to bring that area's waiting list higher up on the waiting list so they can then get their houses quicker so we assist them, we negotiate with them so those people can get their houses in a proper uh, a town planned area, which is not illegally occupied in, the, in the, just in a rural bush area with no water, no electricity, no sanitation. Then those people move out and then we can build the power line as well. So two, two things are happening, which is very good. The person itself gets his proper house and Eskom can at least build power lines so people can be electrified as well. The other part of it is where people are occup illegally occupying our servitudes that do already have power lines built on. That is also a problem that is happening all over the country. And what we do there is we try and negotiate with, land with the municipalities as well to try and get those people up on a waiting list as well. But that happens too much and it's, it's happening uh, uh, that waiting list cannot be moved up for existing people and for existing power lines because they feel that the power line is not a threat yet. So the, they're lagging behind to try and get those people out. However, in our, uh, in our southern part of our country, which is called the Western Cape, the close to Cape Town, uh, at one time, the legal occupants, they use like a paraffin stove, and this paraffin stove fell over and the very strong winds took that fire and burnt down and must be about 50 of these illegal shacks that has been erected. And this huge fire, luckily nobody was hurt or killed, the people ran away in time, but the huge fire tripped the electricity. And with that, with that risk of not having electricity for the, air, the, the illegal occupation risk, the municipality in that area worked with us and we managed to get them into proper housing as well. What we then did was we worked through the area under the power line, we then converted to vegetable gardens and to, to playing fields for football and, and, and other kind of sport. So the community are quite happy now to keep that area open and not allow illegal uh, uh, people erecting any shacks because then it goes onto their vegetable gardens and onto their sports fields. So those are the two scenarios on the existings and on to future line. Ernest, thanks so much for your time. It's come up a little bit. Let's get into a little bit more. I'm coming down in March. What's going on? What's the event? And give the audience a little bit about what you guys have planned for that conference. Now, 
South African Right of Way Association, that's a name that we gave our association. In 1998, uh, when the internet started becoming a, a browser, we heard about the International Right of Way Association. So in 1998, I sent one of my staff members across to the US to the conference in 1998, and uh, he came back with the information on how this is a very good association, how people can network and, and get continuously educated and skilled. We straight away formed the, the association in South Africa, the South African Rights Away Association, and then started with talks with the IWA to become a chapter. So we became a chapter, in, I think it was in 2011, we officially became a chapter 83 of the IWA. The, actually, the first chapter outside the USA and Canada. Now, since we've done that, we have been developing our, our um, co-members in the country. People have been taking the RWA courses, and we already have now registered, uh, I think it is about eight uh, RWA um, right-of-way agents on the credentialing of the RWA. And we are very fortunate that the, the, the members of our association and of the chapter are very uh, eager to, to be skilled, to do attend courses and conferences. Our professional associations for our land surveyors and for our land valuers and our engineers dealing with rights of way related uh, issues uh, need to uh, want the professionals to continuously develop themselves as well. So our association has now got permission from these professional associations to get a certain uh, continuous development uh, points awarded to our programs, to our training, our RWA courses and our conferences. So in March next year we have a two-day educational conference which is an excellent conference. We've got excellent speakers. Thankfully you will be there as well with an excellent presentation. So we've got a few great presentations and great lectures coming up on the two days to give education on the, the challenges of South Africa and remedies on how to come across those challenges. And our webpage is uh, SARWA, S-A-R-W-A, South African Right Away Association, dot C-O dot Z-A, also on Facebook, S-A-R-W-A. All the information is there, all, t all in, uh, the newsletters are there, what happens in the country, some papers on previous papers from our government department will be seen there. And um, it will be great if people can have a look at it and interact with us and deal with our people and uh, we can all build a better global uh, networking uh, even more. Okay, great. And we will link to that in the show notes so people can find out where to register and sign up for this conference. And um, this is not just South Africa. There's people from all over the world that actually come to this thing, several people from the States and people from Africa and just, it's just a good good crowd to be a part of. And so we'll link to that in the show notes so people know where to find it. What else would you like to plug or promote before we let you get off here today? No, thank you very much for the opportunity there, Ryan. This, this was an excellent one, and I'm looking forward to chat to you when you come across again to South Africa. Well, great. Well, hopefully when I get down to South Africa um, in March, I'll bring some equipment. Maybe we can uh, record an updated episode and catch up on what's going on and uh, cover some different topics for another another show. Excellent. That'll be lovely. Okay. Thank you, Ernest. Thank you, and good night. Goodbye. Well, thanks again to Ernest for coming on. It's always good to get to talk to him. He's so knowledgeable about all things South Africa and and the surrounding nations as well. He, he's full of knowledge and, and really embodies what a right-of-way professional should be. So I want to link to a few things in the show notes, and so there will be several links to different power-related topics about South Africa, so you can go and check those out. And also... Ernest mentioned it, and I'll mention it again. The week of March the 6th, I will be in South Africa to attend the Sarwa conference that week. They have a couple different things going on that week, and so I will link to the Sarwa website in the show notes as well, so you can check that out. And if you're in South Africa and would like to meet up, I would love to hear from you. The week of March the 6th through the 10th is when I'll be in South Africa. And so um, if I have some free time and we can meet up, I'd love to do that as well. A couple more reminders. The giveaway, rate and review in iTunes. If you've done that already, you're already in. If not, please go do that. The drawing is just a few weeks away. I will be in Northern California, as I mentioned, 
the week of week of January 16th. I think I fly in on the 17th and leave on the 20th. So I'll be in the Sacramento, Napa area. So if you're in that area and would love to sit down and meet and discuss energy stuff, we would love to hear from you at globalenergyleaders at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Twitter at Ryan Ray Sr. Either way works for me. And a final reminder for my article coming out in the RRWA January, February edition. If you're not a member of the RWA, and you deal with rights of way pertaining to energy, I would highly suggest you consider them. I've done a lot of good networking in that organization. I will link to that in the show notes as well. Thanks for tuning in. Rate, review, and iTunes. We could really use it. It helps boost us so more people can become aware of the show. And until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. 